Hello and welcome. Good evening. My name is Zinat Rahman and I'm the Executive Director of the Institute of Politics. Uh, today's conversation is about America's complicated relationship with guns. Um, before one of our students formally introduces our guests in a few minutes, I'd like to mention a couple of events that we, upcoming events that we have um, at the IOP and go over some housekeeping notes. So on Friday, October 14th, our applications are due for IYC Bridge. This is uh, for students who are interested in volunteering to lead creative writing workshops at the Illinois Youth Detention Center during the winter and spring quarters. Um, on October, on Monday, October 17th, Representative Pete Meyer and Representative Jake Auchincloss will discuss their careers in public service from the military to Capitol Hill in a conversation with former VA Assistant Secretary Kayla Williams. That event will be at the Quadrangle Club starting at 5.30. On Tuesday, October 18th, our current IOP Pritzker fellow, Rana Ayub, and Iranian-American journalist, Nagar Mortazavi, We'll discuss the ongoing protests in Iran following the death of a 22-year-old woman at the hands of the morality police. That um, pop-up event will take place in our living room. We just announced it today. It'll be at the IOP house, at our house, at 3.30 p.m. On Wednesday, October 19th, IOP Director David Axelrod will lead the second event of his three-part seminar-style series, which is focused on the midterms. For this one, he'll be in discussion with David Wasserman, uh, senior editor of the Cook Political Report, and he'll be previewing the upcoming house races. That event will also take place at the IOP living room at 3.30 p.m. Um, after today's moderated discussion, we will open the floor to take questions from you in the audience. So please line up in the middle, ask your questions via microphone. Um, and as usual, we'll give priority uh, first to student questions. Please make sure your phones are on silent. And we'll now hear formal introductions of our speakers and moderator from our graduate student, Nancy Smith. Please join me in welcoming Nancy to the stage. Good evening. Uh, my name is Nancy Smith, uh, and as was mentioned, I am a second year graduate student at the Harris School of Public Policy, originally hailing from Asheville, North Carolina. And I'm excited to welcome you to tonight's IOP speaker series event, From Muskets to M16, America's Unique Relationship to Guns. My own unique relationship to guns started when I was seven, trekking dutifully behind my dad's bright orange vest through the mountains of Western North Carolina, hunting ruffed grouse. I loved everything about those weekends, the crisp fall air, the dog's excitement. Guns were tools to be respected and maintained carefully. Every hunting day, even long before I carried my own gun, started with a very serious conversation about trigger discipline, safeties, and never pointing at things that you did not intend to shoot. It didn't occur to me that guns could be used for such devastating and irreparable harm until at age 12, I watched reports of the Virginia Tech shootings on the news. My mother's whole family comes from Shenandoah, and a good half of them attended Virginia Tech, including my brother, who would one day take engineering classes in Norris Hall and be mentored by a professor who survived the attack there. A place of warmth, love, and family would forever have an undercurrent of sadness. And that doesn't even begin to describe the feelings of those closest to the 32 lives lost that day. Guns occupy a complicated space in our national discourse, one that has touched many, if not all of us. So it goes without saying that we have a lot to unpack tonight. But fortunately, we have just the right people for the job. Mr. Ryan Bussey is a former firearms executive who helped build one of the world's most iconic gun companies and was nominated multiple times by industry colleagues for the prestigious Shooting Industry Person of the Year Award. He remains a proud outdoorsman, gun owner, father, and resident of Montana. His book, Gunfight, provides an insider's look at the rise of a multi-billion dollar firearms industry and its radicalizing influence on American gun culture. Professor Allison LaCroix is the Robert Newton Reed Professor of Law at the University of Chicago Law School and an associate member of the University of Chicago Department of History. She's a scholar of US legal history specializing in constitutional law, federalism, and 18th and 19th century legal thought. Professor LaCroix is currently writing a book called The Interbellum Constitution, Union, Commerce, and Slavery in the Age of Federalism. She also recently served on the Presidential Commission on the Supreme Court of the United States. Mr. Chad King is the co-founder and current president of the Black Bottom Gun Club of Detroit. The club regularly engages in community service projects, community-oriented firearms safety, and legal seminars, and conflict management workshops for young people. 
Chad also serves as the Midwestern Regional Director of the National African American Gun Association, the largest African American firearms organization in the country. Lastly, Chad King is the founder and chief instructor for the Apex Defense Solutions, LLC, a firearms training company. This panel is moderated tonight by SE Cup, the HLN host of SE Cup Unfiltered, a primetime program covering contemporary issues and a CNN political commentator. She is a practical conservative with a fierce independent streak who brings her distinct outlook to each network's programming and special political coverage. So, without further ado, please give our panelists and moderator a warm welcome. Welcome all, and welcome to you all. Thanks for joining me. Um, I first just want to start by reading a couple of headlines. Uh, Oath Keeper testifies about massive gun pile stashed in hotel on the eve of Jan 6th. Court gives New York State more time to argue for its gun law. Metro officer injured in accidental shooting at gun range. Milwaukee man got machine gun parts for Glock from China. The homicide rate for trans people has nearly doubled, with gun killings fueling increase. The nine best gun stocks to buy in 2022. And most recently, Alex Jones must pay nearly $1 billion to Sandy Hook shooting family victims. These are all from today. I got off the plane a couple hours ago, and I looked at today's headlines. So to say guns uh, cross over multiple issues, affect business, crime, mental health, culture, I mean, it's all in there. Um, and the contours are complicated. So the first thing is that it's really good that we're having conversations like this. Uh, I've covered guns for about 20 years. I'm a gun owner, a hunter, um, shooting sports enthusiast. And I gotta tell you, in my business, there are two areas around which journalists are super passionate and really don't know a whole lot. One is guns, the other is religion. Um, it's a very secular space. And it's also, I mean, I don't know a lot of journalists that have real personal experience with guns. So we get a lot of, a lot of passion, but a lot of misreporting. Um, and that doesn't do anyone on this issue in this space a service. So it's really good that we just have these conversations. Um, there's a history of guns in this country, you're all aware. And that history is really important, not just because it's important to a lot of people, but because it's become something of a weapon and a fetish um, at times. So it's important to understand the history and understand why people are so passionate about this issue, why it has informed so much of our political history, to maybe understand how we got here with the kind of problems that we have. Um, and maybe ask the question to start, how do we get here? And to end, where do we go from here? So, um, Professor LaCroix, let me start with you and take me back, you weren't there personally, but take me back to December 15th, 1791, when the Second Amendment was ratified. Why was this important to our founders, coming from where they had, um, to, to put this in writing and law? It's true, I wasn't there, although I feel like <laughs> I know people who were because I spend a lot of time reading their work, um, so coming as close as perhaps one can. And I guess that's, that's a first thing I'd like to note, which is you know, there's this increasing sense that the Supreme Court cares a lot about history. Um, history is very important in particular areas, and one of them is the Second Amendment and gun rights. But there's always this question of that, that is inevitably raised then of what do we mean by history? And so we can talk more about that, but I think there's a sense that you, know, you just sort of dip in and read one source from when the Second Amendment was ratified, 1791, and maybe one or two other things, and now we know what they thought because they wrote it down and they spoke with one voice, and none of this is true. As anybody who's been in any kind of multi-member group knows, there's, as they say, Congress is a they, not an it, so too with the Constitutional Convention. Um, but what were, what, were, what were they, generally speaking, the founding generation, as I like to think of them, 
thinking, or why was this something that James Madison and others included in the Bill of Rights? Um, I mean, I think context is really important here. So what are, what are, the, bill, what are the amendments that became the Bill of Rights about? Um, they're about naming particular rights or liberties or privileges, all of them understood in sort of varying ways in early modern, really Anglo-American law and then American law. Um, and so, you know, the Second Amendment says, I have the text, it's a short one, one can actually read it out loud, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. You know, I think some people meant, um, they're, they're thinking about the English Bill of Rights, for instance, from the 1600s, from the, 16, uh, the century before, and thinking, you know, one of the things you do with some rights is you write them down. But you also, the, the, a part of the kind of way that people thought about rights and constitution writing, unlike how we think of it, I think, was you write some things down, but that's not the whole universe of rights. Um, you sort of underspecify them often again because the multi-member group writing them down can't agree. Um, but what are they thinking? They're thinking things like um, when you have, I mean, the Fourth Amendment is a useful example to think of with this as well. So search and seizure, right? That's how we think of that today. Uh, privacy, maybe some idea that the police or the state can't come in and just start ransacking your home looking for papers. Well, it sort of goes with that. I mean, I think it's this idea that there are certain sort of domains, areas into which um, the state not cannot go, right? Nobody was thinking the state, the government, the king, queen is completely outside of it. Um, but the rights, can, the rights to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, or in the Fourth Amendment context, we start thinking about warrants. So it's that there has to be some sort of showing before the government, whoever its officers are, can just kind of charge in and, and either, again, search one's house looking for contraband brandy that you haven't paid duties on or, um, or things like guns. So I think they're thinking about it as a broad spectrum of the people, which is its own amorphous contested concept, have some body of rights, what are they, and this idea of the militia and the keeping and bearing arms together are, are among those important rights. Well, and just to drill down a little bit, because I'm sure you'll hear or you have heard when it comes to the debate on the Second Amendment, the question generally is, <clears throat> did they mean individual ownership or were they talking about a militia, right? Right. Um, so just unpack that a little bit. Yes, so here is where we also <clears throat> have to come back to the Supreme Court, and it also is a question of which and which Supreme Court case do we, do we look at. Uh, but I would distinguish that from the history as well. So, um, okay, so we look at the clause, right? We look at this clause, and right away, Justice Scalia in DC versus Heller 2008 sort of says, okay, we can read this, right? Because Justice Scalia and others are coming at this from a kind of textualist, originalist approach. That's their method. These are words, we can read them. Well, sometimes it's like a trick, I think. We think we can read them, but the words may mean different things. But I think for Scalia and the majority in Heller, which is about a DC, so federal, regulation of gun ownership, um, Justice Scalia says, okay, that first clause, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, he sort of says that's prefatory, it doesn't really, it's not important to the rest of the clause. So he kind of reads the militia clause out of there. Now, I think if you read, if you do history of the period and you read a lot of 17th and 18th century books, fiction, nonfiction, government works, treatises, you see those dangling clauses a lot and they're not there as just kind of let's put extra words in. So I, in my view, the militia part is actually very important. And so in some research I did with a co-author here at the university funded by the Neubauer Collegium, we tried to actually look at vast bodies of primary sources going back to the 1700s and sometimes to the 1600s. So of course there's always a limitation on counting and what can you count and what's recorded. Um, but we were using various corpora, databases, Google Books and others um, and trying to get a purchase on this question. And so I'm, I'm a historian and a lawyer, so I'm always a little bit hesitant to sort of say there's a number. But a number we came up with uh, based on reading things was that in about 67% of the sources we looked at over this period that roughly included the US founding period, the sense of the meaning in which these terms were used, not only in the Second Amendment, but sort of you know, books, magazines, newspapers, was more collective about this phrase, keep and bear arms. So the militia part, the grammar, and the kind of way people use phrases like, do they bear arms, 
seem to be more in this group membership militia context. And I think the court, frankly, missed that in Heller. Well, yeah. I mean, Heller is not the only case that has tried to adjudicate this. McDonald's yes. or Chicago. I mean, there's lots because this is unsettled. You know, you just outlined some of the opinions, but there is no, there's no science book where you can go to and say, okay, this is clearly what they meant, and this is a fact. That's why it keeps kind of getting brought up again and again and again, depending on, um, you know, the wave of politics. So before I get into some of the next historical inflection points, I was wondering if Chad, Ryan, you guys could weigh in. Do the founders' intentions mean anything from your perspective? Is that <clears throat> important or almost, I mean, the past is the past. Let's talk about now. Well, they're hugely important to our current day politics with regards to guns because, um, you know, I argue in my book and I believe that what happens in guns and gun politics certainly over the last 25 years is a predictive harbinger of what happens in our general politics in our country. Nothing I experienced in the firearms industry 10 or 15 years ago we aren't experiencing now on the political right in the country. <clears throat> and there's four very important words that are exceedingly um, prevalent in today's politics, and that is that shall not be infringed part. Um, it's not an accident that uh, our most feared domestic terror organizations, the Three Percenters, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, all of whom we're now sadly very familiar with, all of them claim gun radicalization around that shall not be infringed, around those four words. All of them claim radicalization in their central organizing tenets, right? Um, it's not an accident that the January 6th flags, there were two types of flags. There were Trump and political flags, and then there were come and take an AR-15 flags, right? That shall not be infringed. There weren't Chevy truck flags or Nike shoe flags or, you know, whatever else flags. There were AR-15 flags. And so that shall not be infringed thing, which is, you know, rest in that Second Amendment, is now the interpretation of it is very centrally important to our political radicalization today. So I think that the history is important, um, but I'm going to come at it from a different type of perspective, simply because uh, as a man of, of, that's a descendant of American slaves, mm -hmm. it wasn't meant for me, right, to begin with. It's a different history. It's an entirely different yeah. history. So, and, and I have to preface what I'm going to say next with that statement, simply because for myself and people like me in the National African uh, American Gun Association, we look at the right to keep and bear arms as one of the indicators of full enfranchisement between land ownership, mm -hmm. education, voting rights, and gun rights. And so we always tell folks that, you know, we want to enjoy and claim all the rights that our ancestors were denied, including the right to keep and bear arms, mm -hmm. right? So from that lens of the historical context is kind of what I approach. But I think what we kind of need to look at is we kind of need to disabuse ourselves of the centralization of the American history narrative around firearms, and particularly around what uh, Randy M uh, Mian calls the human weapons relationship, and look at the projectile weapons industry from a human cultural universal perspective, meaning we have anthropological evidence of projectile weaponry dating back to 70,000 years ago when Homo sapiens first began to migrate around the world. And so the American component of that long trend of history is but a flashpoint where we're at now. Mm -hmm. And so I would encourage folks to look at the American aspect of that history, but also go back further and see that the human relationship to projectile weaponry includes firearms today and that it's a progression, if not an evolution, of from at, uh, what is it, the at lateral spear throwing mm -hmm. up into what we have now with semi-automatics, AR-15s, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's two, two spaces I look at it in, both the anthropological sense as well as the socio-political context. Thank you for that. Um, I think it's um, uncontroversial to say that America has a unique relationship with guns, um, I think some of that is celebrated and some of that, again, I think is fetishized um, and weaponized, but I wanna get to why. And again, to Professor LaCroix, let's talk about some of those other really important seminal moments in our history. Um, for, for me, you know, um, I, I would think the Civil War, the Civil Rights era. I mean, there are some really important moments where 
Um, the Second Amendment was, was really important. You can go through those or go through ones that you have in mind. Right. Well, it's interesting. And again, I think the, the, the way the Supreme Court has worked through some of this is a kind of interesting example. It's not the only roadmap, but it's a kind of interesting way to, I think, get a handle on what history matters at different points and to whom. Um, so, you know, one thing that's been interesting is, so again, D.C. versus Heller, right, 2008, the sort of lodestar of this modern law. Um, Justice Scalia, writing for the majority, says, well, you know, we can look at we can look at Blackstone, we can look at the debates in the Constitutional Convention, um, in, and he sort of had a story about which sources to look at for the history. Now, interestingly, this is an interesting methods question, too, that a lot of people in the constitutional law uh, field took up, sat up and took notice of as well. Justice Stevens dissented in that case. Um, not a surprise, he was one of the liberals on the court. Um, and he also did a version of originalism, some said, right? Some people just said this is a victory for looking at originalism or history. But Justice Stevens said, okay, let's look at other moments or uses of, I mean, if we really want to get purchase on keep and bear arms, this language in the Second Amendment, but we also want to know what people thought was permissible. So let's look at, and then, then it gets very interesting to me, because then there's this question of, like, well, when does the founding end? I mean, can you look at, well, okay, all the states have ratification conventions, North Carolina, Virginia, uh, Georgia, New York. Can you look at what those people think? Okay, maybe, right? Well, what about if they rewrite their convention? What if it's a state that's admitted later, Kentucky? What if it's Ohio? What if you're getting further, further west? And then what about these moments like the Civil War and Reconstruction, which the historian Eric Foner calls the second founding? So how do we think about those things? And then what about, I mean, and as Chad noted, you know, you can look at the pre-Civil War period, right, and see state law after state law, in particular state laws, limiting the ability of enslaved people or free black people to do a host of things, including um, own weapons, purchase weapons, use weapons, read, write, have formalized marriages. Um, and then that, a lot of that is continued after the Civil War and Reconstruction under the Jim Crow regime and, and obviously um, informal mechanisms of, of subordination. Um, so there's a real sort of law in the books versus law in practice story, but I think you know, it is certainly true that you, if you decide that the history or some sort of founding moment matters, then there's a question of, well, when does that founding moment end? Like, when do people stop being the founders? And if you go back and look, at, as I've been doing for my new book project, this period between the founding and the Civil War, they didn't know. They walked around sort of thinking like, well, I missed the revolution, but does that mean that I missed the big show? Abraham Lincoln in 1838 gives a speech in Springfield, Illinois, where he basically says, I know everybody, we missed the big events, but just let's hang in there and try not to mess it up too badly, right? I mean, Abraham Lincoln, he didn't know what was coming. Um, so, you know, I think to me, there's a real change that's happened just since 2008, quite honestly, in this sense. So even Justice Scalia in Heller says, um, you know, this is how we understand the right to keep and bear arms. It is individual. But he has this language where he says, this doesn't disrupt federal firearms regulations, limitations on who can possess them, places, and so on and so forth. And that's now what we're seeing being really challenged and pushed <clears> on <throat> the wall about no, there has to be zero infringement because any infringement is a Second Amendment violation. And it's, it's just kind of mind-boggling to think not that long ago, Justice Scalia was saying, you know, of course things like um, licensing or other requirements or, you know, these other machine regulations, guns. machine guns, right, were permitted, but the right was important. So I think we're seeing this right and then this, this idea about history and tradition I mean, this is where I have, you know, some questions, too, about if you're looking to history and tradition, at what level are you looking to history and tradition? Because is it about there was this right and it was really important, or is it, no, there was a right that a lot of people weren't allowed to exercise? Well, you know, maybe we need to rethink the history and tradition as how we're implementing that. Well, so how were some of these moments informative um, for gun ownership? Why did gun ownership, and this is to all of you, um, become important? after Reconstruction? Why did gun ownership become important during the Civil Rights era? Why did gun ownership become important after World War II and the rise of fascism overseas? All of these things, I mean, it wasn't just that we were all hunter-gatherers one, you know, one time. All of these things really informed the American culture around guns, if anyone wants to get in on that. Yeah, so I think to the, to the question about how did it become important 
uh, gun ownership. What I see is more so it's become an identity, but before it's be it became an identity, it was a thing to do, particularly in the African American community, as a means of self-preservation, right? So when I look at the Second Amendment and all of the amendments in the Bill of Rights, I look at those as enshrined human rights, right? Meaning I have the right to defend myself from any and everyone who oppresses me. When I say oppression, I don't mean simply saying you, I can't do something and, and therefore it's oppressive. What I mean is physically oppressive, economically oppressive, educationally oppressive, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you look at that type of a history through the locus of the African American experience, what I find is that the African American experience, Af African American population has really been the leaven by which the American democ democracy experience uh, has been tested. Um, and when you talk about gun ownership, that's just one mechanism for that testing. And it's no surprise that in the past couple of years, when you see uh, the increase of African Americans purchasing firearms, including the largest and quickest growing demographic being African American women mm -hmm. purchasing firearms, you see there are more calls for additional types of restrictions and, and things like that. Conversely, but what you also see is that in the past couple of years, you've seen um, the growth and the advent of constitutional carry states, mm -hmm. right? So right now, I want to say we have 25 states that are constitutional carry, where before that probably would not have ever been thought of. So it's an interesting mix of black folks getting into guns a lot. Um, and, and it's not, you know, so much as a political statement uh, per se more than it is kind of an, uh, in some cases a necessity based on the historic yeah. experience that we have. But I think it's important to look at that history uh, in total, not just through the locus of you know, what we see from the founders only and then going from there. I think it's entirely appropriate to look <clears throat> at the experience of minority groups in America and why we would decide to own firearms and embrace this right in a way uh, as a means for our survival. And Ryan, I think one thing that gets missed, I know from my experience when I talk about this, one thing that often gets missed when we talk about guns is its relationship to conservation mm -hmm. and the historical connection between um, conservation and, and gun ownership. Um, hunters are responsible for um, so much of, of our conservation of, of animals and um, resources and land. We are protectors of all of that um, as much as hunters are maligned. So explain that um, sort of foundation for yet, yet another um, reason we have such an interest in guns. Well, there's no doubt about it that uh, hunting and outdoor pursuits have played a major role in the social legitimization of guns, right? Um, generally speaking, surveys taken in just about every state when the questions are asked, you know, do you support gun ownership? Um, do you support hunters being able to own guns? Or the, the, the numbers are sky high. Um, and that's, it's not an accident that when the firearms industry went to rebrand after a very expensive rebranding strategy, the AR-15, they could have picked any word or any series of words. They picked modern sporting rifle, right, MSR. That's what the, that's what the industry calls the AR-15 because it trades on this social street cred. Um, but I see what you're talking about. There's... Um, it's largely a voluntarily collected tax. It's called the Pittman-Robertson Act, and it, it essentially imposes what is, for all intents and purposes, a voluntary taxation on all firearms and all ammunition sold in the United States of, a, just think of it, about 10 percent. So, I mean, you, there's no way this would pass today, but <laughs> um, wildlife and wild places were in such a dire situation in the 20s and 30s that the industry and hunters and, and um, fishermen came together and said, okay, we will tax ourselves through, the, through a voluntary tax on this equipment to pay for these, you know, the reestablishment of the American bison, to pay for wildlife preservation areas, to pay, and, and that still is in place today. But what has changed today is that, you know, for a long time in the history of firearms ownership and gun sales in America, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 80 percent of firearms that were sold that, w that did have something to do with sport or hunting pursuits, right? That's totally flip-flop today. Now it's about 80, 85 percent of the guns that are sold for self-defense and then some other nefarious things, which I can't quite figure out. Black guns. Black guns, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. And about t less than 20 percent are sold for uh, 
you know, for hunting pursuits or sport pursuits, yet that tax is still collected on every single gun that's sold. And now there's... And every deer tag, and I know, believe me. <laughs> there, there's, and now there's some rumbling about removing mm. that tax um, <laughs> through some of the shall not be infringed folks, but mm -hmm. a quick primer on how that happened. Um, let's talk about the debate over military grade weapons. Um, you know, people feel very strongly on both sides that it should be your obligation to tell me why I can't have X weapon or a tank. And then on the other side, um, you know, why should you be able to have something that the military uses, a, a weapon of war? I, I guess you could see some legitimate legitimacy in both sides if you wanted, but just let's go over the contours of that a little bit from any perspective you have. Maybe we should start with where we are, like what's actually, like what's actually true. Legal. Because there's a, well, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, as far as the shall not be infringed thing, we've already agreed that we shall infringe this right. We do it every day. For mm -hmm. instance, it's not legal for your neighbor to own an A-10 Warthog and have it in the driveway, right? Can't have, a, <laughs> can't have an M1 Abrams tank and strafe the kids on the way to school. It's not legal. <laughs> um, so we have all these infringements. You can't own, um, you can't actually own fully auto firearms like the Tommy guns mm -hmm. of uh, Al Capone's day. You have to go through what is essentially a magnum background check. You know, you could probably own one of these guns. You have to pass a stringent federal background check and obtain a federal tax stamp to do it. Yet, since that, um, since that bill was passed infringing on those rights, 1937, there hasn't been a single mass shooting, not a single one, involving fully auto guns, even though they're legal. Why? Because we heavily regulate them. Um, AR-15s, which are legal and ubiquitous in the country, um, they are essentially a, they are an adapted M4, M16 military rifle the offensive weapon of choice for our military and many militaries across the world. Um, and then many of the guns that are still in common use today, the model 1911 style pistol, developed in 1911, um, carried by our military and many other militaries across the world, com in and common use. Police, right? our, many of our police mm -hmm. um, forces use them. The standard bolt-action rifle started off as a military rifle, was sporterized or adapted mm -hmm. to the American sporting market. So there's lots of intertwining of uh, military weaponry. You know, I think what's also worth noting, I mean, and this comes up in some, some of what you had just said also, Essie, which is there's this sort of chicken and egg problem in a way, too, of, well, look at, look at the kind of militarization we have in the police forces in most mm -hmm. cities in the United States. You know, if we think that there's this is one argument that's made, you know, if, if the Second Amendment means anything, and that's the kind of military style force that we're talking about the state having, then there's sometimes this sense of, well, the Second Amendment has to, there's some sort of compensatory story going on, which I don't think necessarily everyone believes, but let's just sort of put that out there for the sake of argument. You know, that I think is very atypical if you look at other liberal democracies, liberal in the political, not partisan sense, um, you know, just the sort of the level of militarization of police forces in the United States. And this is something that I think was, you know, got a lot of attention and has been getting a lot of attention, especially, frankly, since 2020 and the protests and the murder of George, George mm -hmm. Floyd and others, where people sort of said, why do the police look like, you know, they're in D.C. or Baltimore or Chicago and they look like they're in a war zone? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think you don't see that in most European or other cities. Although once upon a time, one would go to Europe and be surprised in the airports that the police had, had machine guns. AR-15s, right. <laughs> right. And so, but that's, you know, that's really ancient history at this mm. point. So this, I think, does go to this American culture, not exceptionalism, but just a kind of self-image. Self I mean, these things sort of do feed on themselves at a certain point. And I think that is something we have so deeply ingrained that's certainly a big part of this story. I think that what you're talking about really is the democratization of violence. And when I say the democratization of violence, I mean if the average citizen does not have the means to protect themselves, what that really means is that the state has a monopoly on violence. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm not advocating anarchy or anything of that nature, right? Um, but what you see in countries where citizens, you know, third world countries don't have a means of defending themselves from the violence of the state, um, there is oppression there. Um, and I think that in this country, uh, 
through the lens, again, I, I'm speaking through my experience. Um, in this country, the reason why you have you know, African Americans engaging in this right so much is because they recognize that it is a democrat, democrat, democratizing of that violence um, so that, you know, if, if it really gets really, really bad, um, we'll have a way to defend ourselves. We've seen in instances where you have folks on the far, far right uh, engage in racist violence. Mm. And we don't want to experience that. So for us, a firearm is a way to be a ward against it as need be, right? I was reading a report uh, from, or the study from the Georgetown University survey of gun owners. And in there, for every single, you know, for every gun murder, there were 85 or 86 defensive gun uses, uses where a firearm was present and used but wasn't discharged. About 44% of African Americans have used a firearm as a defensive tool. About 26 or 28 percent of women have used a have used a firearm as a defensive as as a means to defend themselves. So that's what I mean when I talk about the democratization of violence. Not and 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 I, and I think that oftentimes what we do is we look at a firearm as a weapon through the locus of illegitimacy, right? And I think that we should kind of alter that a little bit. Yes, a firearm is a weapon. Yes, a firearm is dangerous. But it can also be a pro-social tool. And when I say it's a pro-social tool, um, I'm talking about the very instances where it's used in an inhumane way mm -hmm. to protect innocent folks or protect oneself. Well, I, I think that brings up a really interesting point because you can't get away from the self-defense aspect of this. And believe me, as a woman, that's a real important part of it. I remember many years ago when I was in college, we couldn't even have pepper spray. And it was scary um, to have zero way to defend yourself. And I remember there was this nonsense going around. Well, see if you can urinate on your attacker. That's insane, right? Um, so the self-defense aspect is really important. But what I've grown concerned about, especially recently, is this rise in political vigilantism. This idea that you're not defending yourself. You're proactively going out with your guns, and we can think of some recent examples, going to protests or standing outside of your house and aiming your guns at people walking by. Where does that come from? I, I know we can't answer that here um, you know, in the next five minutes on this panel. It's a big question, but it's very concerning to me as a gun owner, and I think it's an existential threat to gun ownership, this vigilantism. Yeah, think, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. Well, <clears throat> I was just gonna, and I think Chad's point, um, about race playing, having this really complicated relationship with guns in our country is, is so spot on in, in so many ways. The Mulford Act in California, um, you know, passed, advocated for and passed by gov then Governor Ronald Reagan to essentially keep the Black Panthers from carrying guns around the state capitol in California. Um, then Professor LaCroix mentions how 2007, 2008, something really changed in the country. Yeah, we had a black guy start leading in the polls <laughs> from Chicago, um, in the polls for President of the United States. I was in the industry, firearms industry, when that happened. Now you fast forward to today, and you have this incredible eruption of social angst on, in 2020. Um, prior to Barack Obama leading in the polls in 2007, the United States had never consumed more than 7 million guns in a single year. Never, not, not once. By the time Barack Obama left office, the United States was consuming almost six, 16 and a half million new guns every year. In 2020, the most tumultuous year that any of us can remember, um, the United States consumed over 23 million guns a year. And what happened in that year, I think a very illustrative case, right to Essie's point, you had Kyle Rittenhouse, right? Mm -hmm. Kyle Rittenhouse, young kid, takes a Smith & Wesson military and police, m and 15, takes it down um, to what he thinks is a Black Lives Matter, Antifa sort of burning of a town because he's going to defend this place, and um, kills two, wounds another. Um, and he's celebrated by the firearms industry as a hero, literally celebrated. I mean, I could show you, I've written articles on it, there's memes, there's posters about how this is a desirable outcome. It's a tragedy. It's not a desirable outcome. Um, and this sort of offensive, vigilante, 
I'm going to go down and take on the bad guys. The only thing that saved Kyle Rittenhouse was the fact that the two guys that he attacked, which were also armed, mm -hmm. did not kill him first, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody was justified here um, legally. And I think Essie's right. Not only is it an existential threat, threat to um, firearms ownership, it's an existential threat to our democracy. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. Uh, well, I was just, you know, I feel like there's various kinds of the vigilantism, <clears throat> too. And one thing that changes, I, instances in which the vigilantism purports to be in defense of law and order, right? I think those, to me, are the, first of all, more numerous and frankly, a lot more terrifying examples here. So again, here's one from the 1820s, but there are plenty from the 1880s and the 1960s and Kyle Rittenhouse. Um, you know, the sort of claim is made in Charleston in the 1820s by this group of elite white planters um, who get a law passed to, to, and, and basically execute a, a great number of um, enslaved leaders, supposedly because Denmark Vesey and his associates mm -hmm. were supposedly going to start uh, a, a riot. They may have been, but in the, in, in the event, there was this sort of mass executions, sort of reign of terror. But then what's interesting is, so the, the planter elite controls the state legislature, but you have this wing of people who name themselves the South Carolina Association, who are the same white plantation-owning men who control the legislature, but they set up this separate entity to bring lawsuits, push these prosecutions, right, terrorize and execute people. And they do it in the name of law. But then you have to ask yourself, well, why didn't they do it through legal means, which they also, by the way, controlled? And so it's this, I mean, that's obviously Jim Crow, the KKK, uh, the 1960s and onward. And so there's this sort of social fabric breakdown, I think, where you have this shift of people sort of saying, like, but the government isn't going to protect me, and now I need to sort of stand myself. And that may, you know, I think that is a shift that we've seen, and the sort of openness to hear those kinds of arguments and think, okay, well, then any infringement is an infringement, back to that point, um, really seems like something recent. Well, I think, uh, to Ryan's point, when he brought up what happened in um, 2020 with Kyle Rittenhouse, there were two additional cases around that same time. The murder of Breonna Taylor, mm -hmm. where Kenneth Walker used his firearm to attempt to defend the two of them. Unfortunately, um, he wasn't able to defend himself and, and his girlfriend at the time. Um, a lot of people were quiet about mm -hmm. him using a firearm in self-defense when law enforcement went yeah. to the wrong place. Uh, to the point about vigilantism, the other case was the, the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, yeah. right? In Georgia. Mm -hmm. and, and, in Georgia. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying you know, that he is at fault for his death. The white vigilantes are, the racist vigilantes are totally at fault for that. But what I will say, um, I, I do think often that that type of scenario, uh, we only have to look back two years to see that type of vigilantism, racist vigilantism against black folks, right? And, and that's paired with or coupled with this extension of history, going back to the civil rights era, when you talk about the story of Hartman Turnbull, when he attempted to register to vote in Mississippi, mm -hmm. a few weeks later after he attempted to register to vote, you had the sheriffs and a posse of men try to come and burn his house down, mm -hmm. right? And he shot out of his windows to defend himself and his family. And his famous quote is that I wasn't being, he was an a, a organizer with the NAACP, and his quote was, I wasn't being non-non-violent, I was trying to defend my family. Right. So you have histories like that. You have the history yeah. of Hartman Turnbull, the history of Dr. Ocean Sweet in Detroit, where in Detroit he moved to uh, Garland Street, which is a uh, uh, mixed European ethnic community and neighborhood, uh, as a black dentist. And the two nights he was moving in, he was accosted so much so to the point where he had to defend him and his family's life with a firearm. Uh, fortunately, he was acquitted of the charges, uh, and that was really one of the cases that got the NAACP Legal Defense Fund started. So you see that history rushing forward through today, as recently as the Ahmaud Arbery case, right. uh, that is pushing back against this vigilantism, this extreme vigilantism, whether it be race-based, whether it be uh, politically inclined, so on and so forth. Yeah. I think that also does play a part in what we see. Now, I'm not in favor of the, that offensive vigilantism. I think that, to Ryan's point, I think he's absolutely right where you have seen, since 2008, this rise of uh, uh, racist vigilantism uh, yeah. because of the, uh, the, the presidency and, and nomination of Barack Obama. Um, but even after that, 
uh, the, the emboldened nature that we see where it almost seems is permissible in many cases. Yeah. Um, I think that type of thing has fueled as well. And, and, and I'll, I'll say um, Robert F. Williams stated famously that, you know, we're not here to, we don't use a gun to create violence. We're using firearms to protect against the violence that's already present. And I think for a lot of African-American folks and really for a lot of responsible gun owners who don't have this uh, racial animus, uh, they use firearms in that same way as well, in addition to the comp competitive shooting and shooting sports for hunting as well. Well, and before we go to um, student questions, I just want to end um, with a question about politics, because obviously politics plays a huge role in this debate now. And like everything else, politics has ruined this issue and corrupts it constantly. I'll give you just two examples and then you guys can weigh in. Um, after a horrific school shooting, uh, a newspaper in um, a New York County published the names of every law-abiding gun owner in the county as if to say, here's a target on you. You had nothing to do with this, but here's a target. That is awful and not helpful. And then a more recent um, example of the absurdity um, of, of the way politics has corrupted this issue, the tragic death of a woman on the set of the Rust movie, right? Alec Baldwin accidentally, we can all agree, accidentally shoots and kills this woman. It is tragic. But because he's a liberal that a lot of Republicans, and especially gun-owning Republicans, dislike, they made fun of it and celebrated it and even profited off of it, selling T-shirts, mocking Alec Baldwin. Now, as a law-abiding gun owner, we don't, we don't celebrate the death of anyone, no matter... I mean, we lament that every time. That is awful. But politics, like everything else, has completely corrupted um, this issue and broken it down party lines. And I, I just think that's become uh, Im impossible to, pe to penetrate when we're talking about some of the real problems that stem from gun proliferation and gun access. Yeah, I think... Unfortunately, the partisan nature of, of firearms, the Second Amendment, what have you, um, I blame everybody. I blame, I blame Me both too. sides, right? I look just did. It. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right. I look at it like on, on one end, you have the liberal progressive side of the House looking at firearms again as uh, an illegitimate tool. Uh, and out of a desire to have to reduce violence, they want to look at the medium of violence as opposed to the root causes of violence. When we talk about root causes of violence, poverty is probably the greatest predictor of violence overall. Then there's the uh, socioeconomic opportunity, political disenfranchisement, things like that. No one is on, on the left, you know, they, they, people on the left talk about all of these, these feel-good solutions, but they're really just lip service in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we're really serious about solving the issue of violence as a whole, then we're going to really do the real work of dealing with the root causes of yeah. what violence is. On the other side, uh, you have this fetishization and exceptionalism that our experience as Americans is unique and the best and what have you. And, and mm -hmm. you can make an argument one way or the other for that. But when you begin to fetishize it, when you begin to uh, ignore even in that context, it looks at firearms as an abnormality instead of a normality. And Professor David Yamani from Wake Forest often says that guns are normal and normal people use guns, right? Mm -hmm. And I love that quote so much because I think if we shed the partisanship, we can look at the device as what it is, a device, a tool, right, that can be used for good or bad, just like anything else can be used for good or bad. And it's up to us as responsible Americans, responsible citizens, to do the right thing. Unfortunately, as long as we let politics and partisanship jade our perspective as to what the right thing is, we're going to, we're going to continue to see whether it's the vigilanteism, whether it's the divestment from communities um, that prolif help proliferate violence. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to go to questions unless one of you wants to get in on that. I, I'll, I'll just say that um, I think you know, through the experience of writing my book, and I'm the first one to ever criticize the firearms industry, having come from the firearms industry, and I anticipated um, quite a nasty vitriolic blowback. 
And I did get a little bit of that uh, because I'm pretty highly critical of the firearms industry and where we are today in marketing practices. Um, I've been on SE's network a few times spouting off about it. <laughs> um, but what I came to realize is that there is a vast number of people, responsible gun owners, who are very, very afraid and disgusted with this slice, with this radicalized slice of um, gun ownership. And it, this is like so illustrative of our politics because these loud, <clears throat> you know, these loud people have grabbed the mic and they are setting the tone. And there's all these other people, many of which Chad describes aptly, and they're freaked out like, that's not us. Mm -hmm. They don't represent us. But, <clears throat> but the whole culture and politics of agreement has so permeated the firearms world that, nobody's af that everybody's afraid to speak up and criticize somebody, right? Just, I mean, nobody wants to be Adam Ken and Kinzinger. No, nobody <laughs> wants to be Liz Cheney. Like, there's not a, you know, have you noticed, both of them are losing their jobs. Not a big space for that. And the firearms industry really perfected that. Like, mm -hmm. everybody has to stand together. We're all in this together. An AR-15 is just like a shotgun. Chad is just like those guys that are mm -hmm. storming the Capitol. We have to all stick together. That's and what they, cede no ground. That's what mm -hmm. they impress yeah. upon everybody. And if, yeah. again, if that sounds like our radicalized, divided politics, it really is, mm -hmm. right? It's, we can never criticize our own tribe. So, um, you know, I just want to say, I think it's, I, th I really think this issue is central to our political division because it's so illustrative of authoritarian power and taken too far, it can do all these dangerous things. Um, it goes all the way back to our founding. It winds through race. Like everything that we care about I now, I think is sort of tethered to this gun issue. And I'll Absolutely. just, can I add one foot? Of course. Um, you know, I, I agree with everything that's been said on this because I think it's so, it's so poisonous right now. Um, but I, I think a, a finger can be pointed at a particular source of some of the problem, too, which is, you know, it's the Supreme Court. I mean, I think people want easy answers, and there seems to be a, an easy answer of history and tradition. You know, it's where I started. You just sort of open something and look at something, and it tells you what they thought, and that's what we do. And I just think that does such a disservice to this and many other debates that are right at the center of public life right now, because... You know, there's almost sometimes a dismissive tone. This is easy. You just look at history and tradition. That cannot be the answer. Or even if that is the answer, how do we decide which history and tradition? So I just think that's, yeah. it's shutting something off instead of saying, these, these are hard questions and we're going to have to really think them through. And things are different since mm -hmm. 1791. Yes. Um, okay, I'd love to get some student questions first and then we'll go to non-students. Yep, there's a mic. You can just line up behind it. Uh-oh. Wow. <laughs> this is either a great sign <laughs> or I'm scared. I think so. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you all very much for your commentary on this topic. I was, I, I was recently abroad um, in a position where I was visiting students in, in uh, rural Germany, and they were asking me a ton of questions about guns and what it's like in the United States. And that gave me a lot of perspective on my, my own position. I'm from rural Wisconsin. I own a gun. Uh, hunting has been a part of the tradition in my family for a long time. Um, but what I'm really curious about is, you know, what is the future on the discussion of guns? What can we do to kind of dissuade this, this um, kind of dismissive approach or maybe this approach of, well, you know, this is a problem or just like the, the, the the politics surrounding it, you know, are you aware of any policies um, that, you know, can work to change the perspective and the acceptance on guns? I, I feel like there needs to be some sort of intervention here where we can better educate and accept that we have guns and it's a part of our life and how can we move forward? I think, um, well, thanks to this thing that Professor LaCroix mentions, the Supreme Court thing. Um, and the growing radicalization that we've seen and the seeming willingness to either use guns in some sort of bloody civil war or almost desire to use them, um, I think we may have a few dark days in front of us. Um, and I, I, I know that people are working towards policies, but this Bruin decision, um, coupled with the sort of oddities of the Heller decision, which is you can do this, don't infringe, but here's a way you can infringe, which is mm -hmm. strange. It's hard for people to interpret. Um, you know, now, now firearms are so woven into the far political right that um, I, think we, I think we're in a bit of a fever. 
and it's it's so uh, it could break either way to be perfectly honest uh, the, uh, let me just add one ray of potential a silver lining because I really agree with Ryan it's ominous times but um, I left the NRA a few years ago because they just don't represent me anymore and they don't represent a lot of law-abiding gun owners they're extremist and absolutist on an issue that needs to be looked at with fresh eyes I'm not alone NRA membership is down NRA donors are down there's real division in the NRA and some you know allegations of fraud and some bad stuff um, so that the NRA is in a weakened position, um, I think might be useful, even though I'm a law abiding gun owner and I want representation, that we might be looking at representation in a different way and willing to do that. You also have law, um, lawmakers like Adam Kinzinger who offered a raft of new gun policy that I haven't heard a Republican offer ever. Um, so that could be that could be towards some common sense progress, but we'll see. Hi, thank you. My name is Megan, and I'm from Littleton, Colorado, which you likely mm. have only heard about because that's mm -hmm. where Columbine High School is. Mm -hmm. um, and I tell you that because I feel like I'm on the cusp of a generation whose relationship with guns is all about trauma. Mm. And you've spoken about the experience of Americans of color and hunters and gun owners, but how do we understand the lived experience of our American youth and specifically through the lens of uh, passion and politics being two things that have been used against sort of my understanding of this issue, saying that like my passion about it isn't as legitimate as perhaps this rational understanding of history. So how do we equate those things? And yeah, facts them don't in this feel, care about your feelings, right? Right. That's what right. you hear a lot. That's a great question. So uh, my family, gun owners, um, I hunt and shoot with my kids every chance I get. Um, my kids are also students. Um, they've been very traumatized with guns. They've been in <clears throat> numerous lockdown drills on the days after Parkland. Um, at my youngest son, Badge's grade school, he's got about 500 kids in that grade school. He was the only kid that stood outside um, for 17 minutes. Um, and so I think we have this weird balance, you know, um, between a country that is, we are going to have guns in our country, but it cannot be at this fever pitch thing that is traumatized. It's just not acceptable to have, um, <coughs> to have Ted Cruz suggest that the reason kids get killed is because we don't lock our doors. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, mm -hmm. this is craziness. Um, and, we, and, and that's why I think, again, we're at this sort of precipice, this sort of fever pitch time where I, you know, it's a pretty critical time in our country, I think. Yeah, and I'll add, there's this phrase that one sees every now and then, um, I believe it, from Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes originally, you know, the Constitution is not a suicide pact, right? And it's disgusting in some way. It's sort of a, it's a gross statement because, and I think Holmes probably said it in an off-the-cuff way, but I have three children, right? We have the, I, we didn't have lockdown drills when I was in school and trying to explain to them what it's about, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. And it really is like a sickness and a disease mm -hmm. that this is where we are. So in a strange way, I guess I take some hope from the fact that the young, youngest, younger among us here, all of you um, feel this way because there are some things on which I think the answer is not this sort of wild oscillation, pick a team, you know, everybody go stand with your very extreme view. It's a kind of, whatever this is, is terrible and insidious mm -hmm. and, and a sort of being unwilling to continue to live with it. I mean, I mean I, that shouldn't be a recipe for it, and yet people continue to live with it. Um, so I, I, I hope that that's something we can look for. So I have a kind of a different experience than Ryan in that I didn't grow up around guns. Um, I grew up with the drills, right, because I lived in a rough neighborhood, right, where sometimes on the outside of the, outside of the school, there was, you know, violence gang violence, whatever the case may be. So I grew up around that type of environment and, and not using guns, right? Um, my mother wouldn't let me, well, she didn't care that I had water guns or made rubber band guns, right? That was not a thing that she approved of. I didn't come into gun ownership until I became an adult and began to look at history and look at it as a, uh, a pro-social activity idea. 
And I think that uh, one of the things that, as he said a little bit ago, is that she doesn't feel represented by certain organizations, and that's why she left. Or political parties. Or political parties, frankly. right? Yeah. And I think that, you know, in that gap, there's a small gap between this partisanship where you can find your home at, where you can find people or, or entities that kind of represent your renters, represent your perspectives that aren't in, incredibly polarized. Um, mm. As you were as you were saying, the NRA membership has been down, mm -hmm. right? The National African American Gun Association, our membership has been roughly anywhere between 700 and 1,000 members, new members per month. Mm -hmm. um, we have a fantastic chapter in the city of Chicago, the 761st Gun Club of Chicago, that does a lot of the pro-social stuff, like educating children, like giving people law seminars about firearm safety, um, and, and things like that. So there are spaces and organizations and groups that you can find that will cater to that need or desire to have that more nuanced and contextually balanced discourse around firearms. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be one way or the other. There's space that's, that's there for, um, for middle ground. Also, please vote. Thank you for your question. Hi there, thank you guys so much. My name's RJ, I'm a third year at the college, and I wanna kinda echo the sentiment um, from the last question, I'm a young person. My entire concept of guns is filtered through the lens of literally like hiding in the corner of my classroom in high school. I'm sure I'm not alone with all the students here who have that experience. So we've talked a lot about the Constitution and gun ownership, but I'm actually more curious about the Constitution and the implications and externalities related to gun ownership. So we all know, you know, the Second Amendment guarantees us the right to bear arms, but at what point does the threat that these arms that we're seeing on our streets and in our schools pose such a huge um, burden onto our students and onto our young people that it's actually infringing on the, their constitutional rights for these guns to be existing in their communities? Like, at what point does that serve its own argument that potentially outplays the Second Amendment guarantees that we see in the news today? I think that's, <clears throat> that is the question. Um, I think um, most responsible gun owners believe and have believed in policies that make it a lot less likely for kids to need to hide under desk um, at, at school or to experience, you know, runaway gun violence in our urban areas because um, cheap handguns are flooding into those areas. Most, most gun owners believe in that. But I do want to tell you, and, and SE's right about the general weakening of the NRA, but again, what happens in the firearms industry is very predictive of what happens in our mm -hmm. national political culture. And what is spinning out of that now are these groups that are far, far more radical than the NRA. The, these are the people, I mean, there's a group called Firearms Policy Coalition. I won't tell you, um, their logo starts with an F. Um, and it, it has a, the next word is you, and then no. So it's F U no. That's that's literally that's liter they they post it every day. Like so you want to regulate machine guns, F U no. Mm -hmm. Like that. This is they've got half a million followers on Instagram. They this is this is what's spinning out of it. So NRA may be weakened, but NRA ism is not. Much mm -hmm. like our authoritarian, we may have somebody that doesn't get elected as president. That authoritarian streak did not go away. It's still in our political psyche. It's going to be up to <clears throat> it's going to be up to us. It's going to be up to to you know people like you guys, and then to partner with responsible gun owners to push back against this insanity and say there is no right that lets that lets people infringe on the rights of school kids. Like what country is free where 19 kids in Uvalde aren't free to go to school? That's not freedom. Um, and so we we have <clears throat> this, this right. These political radicals have taken this right so far that they're now infringing on all of our rights, on the right to life, liberty, and happiness. A democracy cannot exist that way. Um, we've, we've, we've got to regain our footing. You know, it would be interesting as a matter of legal doctrine, too. So I'm sitting thinking through this, putting together federal courts, constitutional law, subjects I teach in a doctrinal vein. Um, you know, there's a large body of federal civil rights law that allows people to bring suits for damages against state officers and federal officers. There's a lot of hoops you have to jump through. Sometimes there it's impossible because of qualified immunity, another discussion that I think people have been having uh, for useful purposes in the last few years. But so what would it take to say, I've been deprived of my federal civil rights by some, let's say, state officer or federal officer? Um, 
Well, that's conceivable, and indeed a lot of those statutes, the, the federal ones, go back to Reconstruction. So they are the Reconstruction Acts, the Civil Rights Acts, the KKK Act, explicitly about allowing people, in many cases free black people, free people, to bring lawsuits in federal court knowing that a state court is hostile. The hard thing would be, well, a court has to recognize that a, that a cognizable right has been infringed. Okay, now we run into a problem maybe of a conservative Supreme Court. Um, can Congress write a statute that, that creates a cause of action? Yes. I mean, I think there's a lot of federal regulation of guns. What's out there is under Congress's commerce power. Um, so that's a, I mean, these are great questions to ask in a sense of like, how do we get purchase on this? It doesn't answer the question. It just might reframe it and say, can someone think of this as, I mean, you know, one has to mention Dobbs and the overturning of Roe here, right? So if we take life seriously, then is that a way that that is part of this story? You know, and I think to me that is a possible, those are worth trying, you know, litigants and, and um, frankly members of Congress and state legislatures thinking creatively about these sorts of statutes. Go to law school. Yeah. <laughs> Help I mean, us that's out. that's implied in everything I say, so yes. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Yang. So my question has to do with gun culture's influence on politics. So Jason Kander, uh, who ran for Senate office in 2016, made a gun ad, which was considered a masterpiece, basically uh, piecing together an AR-15 blindfolded. Uh, so it was considered the best gun ad at the time, but it also accentuate the weakness of people who are pro background check. So they have to make concession first uh, to prove to the voter they want to speak to that they are part of them. They know how to use guns. And this also part of the strategy by NRA, not saying, well, Democrat is going to take your gun away because that's unrealistic. They instead would use uh, the you know, more subtle way to suggest that this guy doesn't know how to use gun. He's not part of you. So. I want to know to what extent is this buy-in or compromise on this sort of tribal thinking on gun culture detrimental to the rational debate on gun use and regulation? And what are the alternative strategy for Democrats or for office, uh, office seeker uh, to speak to those people in deep red states? Well, let's just say it right now. There is no rational debate on guns. It doesn't exist. Mm -mm. I mean, not only is it damaging, it, damaging to what? It doesn't exist. Um, because uh, any debate with anybody, generally speaking, on the right side of the aisle at this point until the fever breaks is this sort of no infringement thing. And y you can't have a discussion when there's no discussion about what, what you know, infringements can happen because we've now labeled everything as an infringement. Background, universal background checks, infringement. Um, I don't think they are, but you know that's not a rational debate, and I think you're right that the the conversation is so reframed, and you know I often tell people this: um, background checks pull at about 82, 85 percent, something like that. Universal background checks. I promise you, ice cream does not pull at 82 or 85. Mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Should. And and yet, and yet, mm -hmm. potato chips don't pull at 82 or 85 percent. Mm -hmm. right. But. Mm -hmm. Yet background checks do, and we cannot pass them. We have not passed universal background checks since the shooting happened in Littleton, Colorado, which um, it's called the gun show loophole, right? We still haven't done it. 1999, we still haven't done it. How is that? I think it's because guns, gun culture, the hell no-ism of NRA is so intertwined in one of our political parties, right? You're not attacking a policy. You know, it, it looks like it's a little pebble an 82% thing, you should be able to pick up and toss it into the yes column. But you pick it up, you try to pick it up, and it's attached to a bigger boulder. <clears throat> that bigger boulder is attached to a bigger mountain, and that bigger mountain is the DNA of one of our political parties, like this hell no, we will not move, it's, you know, it's, we will not give an inch. And that's why these things that pull so high cannot be attacked, um, because it's so woven in the DNA. It's so woven in the DNA that a Democrat running for Senate in Missouri has to demonstrate how, how much he likes this big mountain by disassembling his M16 blindfolded on camera in his political ad, right? Which was, it was a genius political ad, but um, not genius enough to get 
Kendra elected, but it was good. Um, <laughs> but I think it's a much larger issue than it, than it appears, and it's woven through our politics. Yeah, the two word the two word phrase that we always use at the NRA, and I say we because I was a member and also I, you know, a spokesperson. Slippery slope. Everything was a slippery slope. I mean, CDC research, yes. funding research on gun violence, slippery slope. See, that's not rational. So, that is so not that's rational. also the first year of law school where yeah. everything is a slippery it's not slope. Rational. And then it's by second year, people rational. are like, okay, we have to still make policy. I mean, you can you say can't. So, I mean, you just can't. You can't. Yeah. How do you talk about it? Yeah. So I think like that. how you engage in rational discourse around firearms is being the person that presents rational solutions, right? Um, if, if we all sit here and say that there is no rationality to be, to be had, then that kind of removes ourselves from that discourse, and we can't disengage from the discourse. So if we want to talk about what's rational, let's think about creative ways that will accomplish some of the things that some folks want while leaving some things alone. Like, there, I, I, I was reading not long ago that there's a way to do universal background checks without having to register the type of a, per, a, type of a firearm that folks want, because if the concern or if the, the, the reason for rationale for a universal background check is to make sure the wrong people don't have guns, then run the background check on the person. What does it matter what type of gun they get, right? If it's, if it's an issue of the person having this tool, then run the check on the person and leave the registration of the tool out of it, right? That's one way to do it. Um, so I think that there's, you know, hybrid approaches to do some of the things that those on the left want to do, there's a way to uh, avoid some of the things that the folks on the right want to do, but it takes courage to be able to present some of these solutions. It takes ingenuity and creative intelligence to be able to present some of these ideas in a way that's not going to, uh, that's going to basically force folks to take their blinders off. You have to take the blinders off of people. You so know, Kensinger got, Kensinger got this courage as soon as he announced he wasn't going to run, uh -huh. right? That's when he found <laughs> the courage. So. Um, listen, I'm sorry, we have time for one more question. I, we're already over, but I love your questions. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Zachary Leiter. I'm a second year in the college. Uh, as a native of D.C., uh, I think one of the issues which comes up with, with D.C. First Heller is this issue of, of guns rights, of, of gun rights, but the other issue is, is an issue of jurisdiction. Um, so I wondered, especially in the wake of Bruin, whether you could talk a little bit um, about the interplay between state versus federal legislation uh, and, and gun issues. You're going to see a deluge. You're already seeing it. Um, I, I mean, there's going to be hundreds, if not thousands, of cases fi filed in states across the country again, because of Bruin. Um, so these state municipal regulations on firearms can't carry them here, can't buy this kind of gun, has to be this size, all of these Thing. California has lots of them. You're going to see them all challenged. It's, um, I mean, the, there's 10 or 15 or 20 cases being filed a day, and those will make it to the appellate courts and they'll make it to the Supreme Court. One thing that's interesting in all of this, though, is situating it. I mean, we see across various dimensions the sort of federalism angle of a lot of these cases, but outside the gun context. And for the longest time, it was conservatives who liked states, states' rights, you know, sort of state sovereignty, Tenth Amendment kinds of arguments. Um, and then that has flipped, and then it's flipped back. So, and then what, what do we think about municipalities, cities, and counties? So sanctuary cities, marijuana, and now guns, right? So um, I think one thing that's interesting is we're in this moment of shifting. I mean, I think if you still ask most Republicans or conservatives, you know, what do you think about states? It's like, we love states, right? I mean, you see <laughs> it even in Dobbs, right? Let's let the states decide. It's like, well, we often thought that wasn't a great idea, but okay. Um, hmm. So here... You know, here too, I mean, I think there's this getting down to the levels of counties and cities because they can also defy to a great extent. And so um, there's a lot of room within our federal multi-layered system for cities and counties, wherever they are, whoever they are opposing, to oppose. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that, which is not great in terms of uniformity and how do we know what the rules are, but I think it's going to be pretty messy in terms mm -hmm. of counties opting out of states and cities opting out of counties, um, jurisdictional lines are really going to matter. It's going to be very messy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I want to thank all of our panelists, Chad and Professor LaCroix and Ryan, um, and thank you all for your questions and for coming, and thanks to the University of thank Chicago you. and the IOP.